In this video, we'll be taking a little bit of a detour from formal linear algebra to just talk about some of the words that I've been using in a lot of the previous videos. So, I talked about the dimension of the solution spaces of linear systems, and today we're going to compare that to another idea of size, cardinality. So we're going to get the, the distinctions between both cardinality and dimensions of a given set in this video. Alright, so let's talk about the definition first of cardinality which in a, a real sense is, is kind of our classic idea of the size of a set. So for cardinality, um, it's just the number of elements inside our set. Um, we'll often use the notation for cardinality. We'll put A inside a little upright stand, so this is just the size or number of elements. And we'll also sometimes use number of A or N of A when we start looking at equivalence classes of cardinalities. And in general, the big question is how can we tell if two sets are the same size, meaning how can we tell when two sets have the same cardinality? Ideally, or you know, one way of doing it would be we can take our sets A, B, and C, so our set A and our set B, you know, let's call this red, blue, and green. And these two sets are, are obviously for finite sets like this. We can just line them up and count the number of elements in each, and then check whether or not our counts are the same. So that's one way of checking that A and B are same size. A better way that we're going to do, so this is step one, um, a second way of doing it is to find a map between our sets that's a bijection. And so this is actually going to be our, what we use eventually as our definition of things being equinumerous. So equinumerous is just the, the more fancy formal math word meaning same size. Um, and the way we, we prove the two sets are the same size is we prove that we can make a map that pairs them up one to one. So for a pair of sets A and B, let's just do maybe sets that are and are not the same size, and our set B. If I try to construct a bijection between these two sets, so there's maybe one map. See that no matter what I do, because A and B, in this case A is larger than B, there's never going to be a way for me to construct a bijection. If they were the same size, though, there exists um, actually many maps where we can pair up elements inside our set. So in this case, we'd be able to see immediately our size of A and B are the same. And just as a reminder, um, the definition of bijection is the map is injective, meaning if any pair of elements map to the same guy inside our, do inside our range, um, we actually, they had to be the same element that they both came from. So this says that for each element in B, there's a unique element in A that maps to it. And it has to be surjective, meaning if we start with some element B, there is at least one element of A that maps to it. All right, to illustrate this, let's actually look at a pair of sets and show how we can explicitly put them in bijection rather than counting them up individually. So we're going to start with B be the positions on a baseball team. So pitcher, catcher, first base, second base, third base, some outfielders, a shortstop. And our second set be U.S. Supreme Court justices. So while this might seem a little, a little unusual, in practice this is actually a pretty good, good pair of sets since we can actually line these guys up and just say for each of our current Supreme Court justices, like maybe we have Alito on this side, Kagan, Ginsburg, etc., all the way down to, uh, let's say, Scalia. Put him there. We could line them up with our positions. So maybe pitcher, first base, shortstop, all the way down to catcher. And our proof that the number of Supreme Court justices is the exact same as the number of baseball positions is we just 
you know, assign them each position to play. So we set up maybe a uh, an inter-federal court league where each of our Supreme Court justices will take one of these positions. So you notice the way I'm drawing this, um, we're actually constructing a map from Supreme Court justices to baseball positions. We're going to have them play. So this is actually a proof, these last few lines going in, this is a proof that A and B are equinumerous, that B and S are equinumerous. In general, there are three main types of sets that we'll consider in linear algebra and further, and we're going to be looking at finite sets. So these are sets that are equinumerous to some set um, of size n, which typically we use the set, the, the first um, n natural numbers. We say that a set is countable if we can put it in bijection with the natural numbers. If a set is countable, we typically say it has cardinality. This notation is aleph naught. And a set is uncountable if it's in neither finite sets or countable sets. So finite sets, there's infinitely many possible finite sets, but there's really only one equivalence class of countable sets. Something that's worth noting is for countable sets, there are actually some unexpected sets that are of the same size. So it's actually not too hard to prove that the size of the natural numbers is the same as the size of our set of rationals. So an argument to prove this is essentially to start lining up all of our fractions. So two. You might notice there are some repeats here, so we'll just cancel these out as we go along. Three over one, three over two, three over three. <clears throat> and the bijection that we can construct between these two is just to take a map and start pairing up as we go, skipping any that we don't need to count. And our map is just going to assign two, three, four. It'll assign the ne next natural number left unused in our list to the next like fraction that we encounter. And you might notice this is actually only the positive rationals that I wrote down, but this would work more generally for for other, uh, for both positive and negative, lining them up in both directions. Um, it's actually um, another really interesting argument to prove that the size of the natural numbers is actually smaller than the size of the real numbers, strictly smaller than. And so this is um, something that can be proved using Cantor's diagonalization argument. There's actually a whole universe of sets that we can be working in. So we actually are going to lump a lot of these together by size. So the way we construct the idea of a size of a set overall is we look at the equivalence class of all sets that are equinumerous to a given set, and we call this the cardinal number of A. So given a pair of cardinal numbers, we say that they're equal if there's a bijection between some pair of elements. And Given a pair of these cardinals, we say that one cardinal is less than or equal to another cardinal if there is an injective map going between them. So this idea of having a smaller or equal cardinal, um, we can construct by finding injections rather than bijections. Um, later we'll see this actually isn't a proof, assuming you can construct an injection between two sets, this isn't a proof that they have different size cardinals. So for example, we can take our our set of natural numbers, and we can actually map it to a subset of itself where our map is take f of n to twice n. And clearly the natural numbers are the same size as themselves, so mapping it to a subset of the natural numbers, namely the even numbers, uh, this isn't a proof that the even numbers are somehow smaller than the natural numbers. Um, on a related note, this is actually the definition of an infinite set. So infinite sets are precisely those that can be mapped to a uh, 
uh, to a smaller subset of themselves. Let's look at two sets that we don't classically view as the same size and see how we can still construct a map between them. So our two sets are going to be the open interval from 0 to 1 and the real numbers. So this has a finite length, while this one has an infinite length. But these two sets are, still have the same cardinality. Our way of constructing this is actually going to be to make some map from 0 to 1 that maps our open interval. You'll notice I've actually drawn up the closed interval, but we're only going to map our open interval between these two. And our map, we're going to steal a little bit of material from trig here, is going to be a modified tangent function. So we'll take our map to be the map f of x, which will be tangent pi x minus a half. And feel free to check this out in Maple and see what a plot of this looks like. But this is exactly the bijection that we want, taking us from our set 0, 1 out to the real numbers. As a fun exercise, I'd like you guys to try out and prove that the interval between 0 and 1 has the exact same cardinality as say the interval, the closed interval from 0 to 1. So this is a fun, not that trivial exercise to try to construct a bijection that actually proves this relationship between their sizes. Um, a more unexpected bijection, and this is really where we're going to see that distinction between cardinality and dimension, is the real numbers are precisely the same size as the plane R2. And this is non-trivial to prove, but one of the clever approaches to do it is to use something called a space-filling curve, where we can actually, instead of constructing a map from all real numbers, we'll construct a map from some finite interval, for example 0, 1, to the plane. And so clearly Z doesn't cover the plane, but we can iterate this process to get what will eventually be something called a space-filling curve. This will actually be a surjection and not an injection, depending on how it's done, but there are ways to modify these functions. So to reconcile this um, idea that even though the real numbers and the plane have technically the same size, what they don't have is the same dimension. So that's really the difference between these two that we'll be able to see as vector spaces We could get by in the real numbers picking any non-zero vector that we want. And with that, we'd be able to write for any vector, which would just be some constant a, we can write any real number x um, as some non-zero multiple of this vector v. Whereas in the real numbers, this is something we'll have the technique to prove fairly soon. In the real numbers, given any single vector, its span is strictly smaller than the real numbers uh, R2. So we'll look at this idea of dimension of a vector space and this minimal spanning set. We'll come back to this in two classes when we start looking at um, linearly independent and linearly dependent sets and the idea of dimension more formally. Because we'll be able to get by with using only one vector to hit every um, vector that's inside of our real numbers, we say that the dimension of R is 1, but because in, as a vector space over the reals, R2 can't be spanned by a single vector, but can be spanned by a pair of vectors, we say that the dimension of R2 is equal to 2. And this will be a nice semantic divide later that we'll be able to look into. Given a vector space, this idea of the minimum number of vectors required to hit every vector in our vector space is a good way for us to distinguish between these sets that are otherwise the same size, at least as sets, but not the same size as vector spaces.
In the next video, we'll be looking at what it means to multiply a matrix by some vector and get a new vector b, and what it means to multiply two matrices a and b together, and why in matrix multiplication it's not necessarily the case that multiplying a matrix a and b together one way is the same as multiplying in the other direction.